Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about the neuropsychology of personality. The neuropsychology of personality, it's a very, very important field because it's the field where we try to explore the neuronal basis of the personality traits. So there are lots of discussions and this is an ongoing theme. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on the Neuropsychology of Personality. Personality, it's a concept that tends to be used to describe a set of features that manifest a unique profile of an individual. This unique set of characteristics are defined as the personality traits. Typically, these traits may be manifest in core beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, motivations and needs. Neuropsychology of personality tends to explore the neural basis, typically we are talking about the brain structures and neurotransmitter systems of personality traits. Neuropsychology of personality explores also the neural correlates between neurocognitive skills and other personality traits. Correlations between executive functions and openness to experience is just a simple example of these neuronal correlates that are studied in neuropsychology of personality. Previously, relationships between brain structures and personality traits were detailed in, in one major case that allow us to have some different ideas about how the brain may correlate with personality traits. This was the case of Phineas Gage, where the destruction of the orbit of frontal cortex led to profound personality changes. These changes were impulsivity, risk behavior and decision-making deficits. In this sense, clinicians start to understand that there may be some correlates between brain structures and some personality traits. In this case, we are talking about the destruction of the orbitofrontal cortex, which is an area related with decision-making and effective modulation, which implied some modifications on the Phineas Gage personality. Several studies explore the correlates between neurocognitive function and personality traits. I give here two examples. Deficits in attention, immediate and delayed memory, visual spatial abilities and language correlated with the trait impulsivity in borderline personality disorder. Openness to experience correlate more strongly with verbal crystallized intelligence than executive function and fluency. So this shows that our personality trait openness is more strongly related with verbal crystallized intelligence than executive function and verbal fluency. These are just two examples of a very strong body of research that tends to explore several neural correlates between neurocognition or neurocognitive abilities with personality traits. But this is just a small representation of this body of research. So, as I said before, some personality traits may be correlated with the frontal lobe. Typically, we are talking about planning and judgment, mental organization, problem-solving abilities, decision-making abilities, other personality traits, abstraction and affective modulation. So, the frontal lobe tends to be described as the major aspect or the major neuronal structure associated with personality and personality traits. However, 
we can trace other personality traits to other brain structures, okay? But I will leave that for future videos. So by taking a localizationist approach, we see that the frontal lobe may be the major neuronal structure that is very, very associated with different personality traits. Personality may be allocated in the major divisions of the frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and cingulate cortex, or even ventromedial cortex. So, several personality traits tend to change when some of this structure of the frontal lobe gets some type of damage. So, now let's see the summary and key points. Neuropsychology of personality explores neural correlates between neurocognitive skills and personality traits. We saw also that the destruction of the orbital frontal cortex led to profound personality change, which implies a relationship between the frontal lobe and personality, alright? So, this is just an introductory video of the neuropsychology of personality, but in the future I will detail more of these issues in further videos, okay? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about the neuropsychology of emotions. Typically, the emotional domain its a domain that is not very explored by clinical neuropsychologists as, for instance, memory, attention or executive functions. But we can see how emotions are extremely important in other neurocognitive processes. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So, now let's take a brief look on the neuropsychology of emotions. Emotions in neuropsychology are typically overshadowed by the assessment of memory, executive functions and language. In this sense, emotions tend not to be the primary target for neuropsychological assessment. However, in the past three decades, there was an increased interest in uncovering the neural architecture of emotion. Some of this uh, interest was related to the magnetic resonance imaging scans that provided several new evidences. Lesions in the amygdala, in the medial prefrontal cortex, in insula, and in the somatosensory cortex help us to understand that there are several underlying structures related with emotional disorders. In this sense, neuropsychologists start to have a different perspective on the assessment of emotions. 
In this sense, emotional regulation starts to gain some traction in neuropsychology. We define emotional regulation as the intra- and extra-organism factors by which emotional arousal is redirected, controlled, modulated and modified to enable an individual to function adaptively in emotional arousing situations. So, emotional activation may be described as a consequence of two root models. One is the fast emotion processing, which relies on the amygdala, insula, ventral striatum and anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortex. Typically, this is described as the ventral system. And the other root is described as the slow emotion processing that rely on dorsal, lateral and medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate gyros as well as hippocampus and temporal parietal regions. Which means that emotion may be activated through a fast root processing and emotion can be activated through a slow emotion processing route. So here you can have a diagram that try to explain to you the biological basis of emotional activation. One is relied on top-down appraisal systems, which implies the lateral, medial, prefrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex, which is described as a slow emotional processing route. However, when we think about a fast emotional activation route, we think about the basal ganglia and the amygdala which are called as the bottom-up appraisal systems. So we have a top-down appraisal system and a bottom-up appraisal system. Okay? So these are just introductory concepts for you to know that emotional activation tend to follow these two routes. Emotion can be activated through a bottom-up appraisal route or a top-down appraisal route. So, as you probably know, emotional activation is a very complex issue in neuropsychology and neuroscience. Here I will show this diagram for you to understand that the activation of emotion does not rely on just one brain structure or one brain system, okay? Emotional activation is very complex and rely on several brain structures and several brain systems, okay? In the future, I will take a different look or a more in-depth look on these specific areas, okay? You can see that amygdala tend to receive some stimuli from the polymodal sensory cortex and amygdala projects to the hypothalamus which projects to sympathetic activation which implies some activation of the behavioral aspects of emotion such as rapid heartbreak, galvanic skin response, paleness, pupil dilatation, blood pressure elevation and other things. So, there are several brain systems which are associated with the projections from the amygdala which imply a behavioral and somatic emotional activation beyond cognitive activation of the thought processes associated with the emotional processing. So, you need to take this in mind, okay? But in the future, we will talk on these more fundamental aspects of emotional activation. So, emotions are a very complex mental state that encompasses several connections between the cortical and subcortical areas in the brain and especially with the neuroendocrine system. Normally we look to this as the neurobiology of emotions, but in the future I will make a different videos specifically focused on the neurobiology of emotions, okay? Here I will try to show how neuropsychology may be very important if you want to study emotions and the emotional experience. But typically emotions are a complex phenomenon that is extremely studied in clinical psychology and psychotherapy. So now let's see the summary and the key points. Typically emotion is not the main focus in neuropsychology because neuropsychology tends to rely more on neurocognitive processing. MRI show that, that there are a neuronal architecture of emotion and neuroarchitecture or emotion can help us to understand how emotional processing, how emotions are activated. Emotional processing may be activated by two different routes. One fast route, which is typically associated with the bottom-up appraisals, and one slow route, which typically is associated with the top-down route. And as we saw in the, in the end, there are 
several brain systems that are related with neuro with emotions which imply that the neurobiology of emotions it's a very complex field in neuropsychology and in neuroscience well it's all for today don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind, to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!